Let's go to the word this morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. This is the story, obviously, of when Jesus was born, but I want to I start in verse 8, after he was born. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Somebody say all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, and this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Hallelujah. Turn with me to John chapter 1. Let's start in verse 1. In John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Let me stop there for just a moment. In the beginning was the Word. Before anything existed, there was what? The Word. You know, sometimes as we have challenges in life, different things come our way. The question that you have to ask yourself is what's in the beginning of your situation? What do you look at? When you have an opportunity, what do you look at when you have that challenge that comes your way? Because the Bible says this. He says that we have been made more than conquerors through him that loved us. Now thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. Praise God. And so it doesn't matter what comes my way. I know that I have the word of God concerning my situation. So I'm not going to make the word of God my last resort. I'm going to make it my first resort. Hallelujah. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Everything that was made was made by the Word. That tells me that whatever we see in this natural realm, there's something that supersedes it. There's something that is higher than it. I don't care what's going on in my body. I don't care what's going on in my finances. I don't care what's going on in my family. There is something that supersedes what I can see, what I can taste, what I can touch, what I can feel. What, you know, whatever my senses tell me, all of that is just natural and was created out of the Word. The spirit realm supersedes the Word of uh, supersedes what I can see. The Word of God supersedes that, and so. All I want to do is I want to find out what the Word of God has to say about my situation. I want to see what God has said about it and allow that to change the way that I think, to change the way that I believe. Because Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Now look at verse 4. In Him was what? 
life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In him was life, and the life was the light. Amen. I want to say this again. You need to get this. The life that was in him, that was the light of men. The life of God is in the word, but in the person of Jesus Christ. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy, undo the works of the devil. He said in John 10, 10, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. We know John three sixteen that says that um, um, whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. How are we to be a light to the world outside? How are, we be, how are we to be a light to our coworkers? How are we to be a light to our family? How are, we, how are we to be a light to our friends? We must be experiencing the life of Jesus. The life that is operating on the inside of you becomes a light to those outside. It is imperative that we as believers, we're not, we're not just Christians so that we can go to heaven. For so long, we've just preached, get saved so that you don't go to hell and go to heaven. No, there's so much more than that. Jesus came to undo, to destroy the works of the devil in our life right now, today, so that we can live abundant life right now, today. And if we are living it, if we are experiencing it, if we are uh, walking in the victory that God has already promised us, that becomes a light to those that are outside. Life. Life, Romans chapter 8, turn with me there. Hold your finger here. You can forget the five minutes, Patrick. <laughs> no, he knew, he knew that wasn't going to happen. Glory to God. Praise God. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead, the spirit that, that gave life to that dead body in the grave, that same spirit, that same life-giving spirit, he says he will also quicken or make alive your mortal bodies. He's not talking about when you get to heaven. You have the life-giving Spirit of God on the inside of you right now that is generating life in your body. Sickness and disease should not reign in your body. Not with the Spirit of God. Look, if death couldn't hold Jesus, the Bible says that it was not possible for death to hold him. Why? The Spirit of God went in there and created life, and the power of God that raised him up is the same power that is operating in you today. But the only way to connect with that power is by believing what God has said. That's why Jesus said, your faith has made you whole. As he's walking down the street and the crowd's pushing him and touching him and all of that, all of a sudden he was aware of the fact that the power of God left his body and he stopped. And he said, who touched me? And he looked around looking for who it was. He said, I know. And the disciples were like, look, everybody's touching you. What do you mean who touched you? He said, no. He said, I felt power go out of me. Somebody touched me with a different touch. And he looked around and he found the lady who had had an issue of blood for 12 years. Who had been saying, if I can just touch, if I can just touch him, I'll be made whole. If I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. 
And she got out in a street where she wasn't supposed to be because she was considered unclean, right there where uh, a, a person that had the authority, Jairus, the, the ruler of the synagogue, had the authority to say, stone her in the face of possible death. She, her faith carried her. She pushed through that crowd. She touched the hem of his garment. But something, what was different about her touch? Everybody else was touching Jesus, but they didn't get healed. What was different about her touch? She believed. Her faith connected her with the power of God. The life of God, while it resides on the inside of you, if, if you are a born-again Christian, will only be activated in the level of, uh, 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 to, the, to the level of which you're able to believe. I didn't say that exactly right, but you understand what I'm saying. With what measure you measure, it shall be measured to you. Again, Romans 5, 17, one of my favorite scriptures is, um, is they that receive abundance of grace. They that receive abundance of grace shall rule and reign in life by Jesus Christ. Let me just turn over there and read that since we're here in Romans Romans chapter 5, verse 17, for if by one man's offense, death reigned. In other words, because of what Adam did, death ruled over us all much more. Somebody say much more. We must develop our mindset uh, and, and our thinking to, to, how do I say this? We, we must change our mindset and get our thinking to where we are living in the much more of God that we're not praying and that we're not believing just to get barely enough to take care of whatever our need is for today, to take care of whatever sickness we've dealt with for today, to take care of whatever family problem that, we, that we've been having today. You know, we have a tendency to, to make our request known unto God and then pray for just enough just for that. Whereas Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And they that are able to receive abundance of grace. How much grace are you able to receive? Because I can tell you the reservoir of grace that is available to you far surpasses all that you can ask or think. So I think what I want to do is I, I, I want to increase my capacity to receive. It says here, they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life. Not reign in heaven, but shall reign in life by one or through one Jesus Christ. We have been made to reign. Say, I have been made to reign. We have not been made to be ruled by death. We have not been made to be ruled by everything else that goes on in the world. We have been made to reign and to live life victoriously in Jesus' name. Much more. Somebody say much more. Now go back to John chapter 1. So it says in verse 4, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now, let's go down to verse 14. And the word, that word that existed in the beginning, that word that created everything, that word that nothing can overcome, that word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's Jesus, full of grace and truth. Now keep those words in mind. Verse 16, and of his fullness. What was he full of? Grace and truth. Of his fullness have we all received. And grace for grace. Now, go with me to Isaiah chapter 54.
We looked at this a little bit last week, Isaiah chapter 54, verse 8. In a little wrath, I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness. Somebody say everlasting kindness. Everlasting. But with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord, thy Redeemer. Glory to God. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wrath with thee, nor, re, uh, nor rebuke thee. Verse 10, for the mountains shall depart. Not if the mountains will depart. The mountains shall depart. This will happen at the end of days. For the mountains shall depart and the hills will be removed. But my kindness shall not depart from thee. Man, this, this gives me every time I read it. My kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant. Somebody say covenant. covenant. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that has mercy on thee. Now here he is prophesying of a time. Under the Old Testament, they could be concerned about God being angry with them. They could be concerned about God's wrath. There are instances of that in the Old Testament. Sometimes we make the mistake of reading the Old Testament and thinking that it applies to us in the way that we live our lives. And so people today think that uh, sometimes they have a, this mindset that God is an angry God, you know, and that he's mad at them for what they've done, what they didn't do, those kinds of things. But here I have a promise from God that says, the mountains shall depart. The hills will be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from you, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed. Now, let's go back to Luke chapter 2. In Luke chapter 2, and let me encourage you... Um, for those that were not here Wednesday night, and I think we have just a few CDs out there, we make all of our all the CDs of our uh, of our services free. They're just out there um, in the front, there on the ledge. But um, uh, if you if you don't have it, you can go to the website lifeoffaithchurch.org or download our our app on on your phone, uh, Life of Faith Church. Wednesday night, uh, a message uh, that we titled "Christmas Law versus Christmas Grace." Christmas Law versus Christmas Grace. And just looking at the contrast between Zacharias and Mary, and you get a, a, a type of law versus the grace of God is just powerful. Verse 8, again, there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks or their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were sore afraid. I said this last week, but why did, why did, uh, why did the angel show up to shepherds? Because these shepherds were responsible for raising, their industry was for raising the, uh, the sheep, the lambs that were used for Passover, that were used for sacrifice. And so they were announcing to them that they were about to be out of a job. They did, probably didn't think about it at that time. <laughs> but they were announcing that, uh, that this covenant of having to have a sacrifice every year was about to be done away with. Glory to God. And so they said, fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which, which won't just be to the Israelites, but it's going to be to all people. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly, somebody say suddenly. 
Listen, I believe that these angels, this host of angels, they had been waiting for this moment for hundreds of years, thousands of years, waiting for this moment where the word of God that created this earth, that created uh, um, this universe, that very word was going to be born in the side of a human being and become the last Adam. A reconciliation was going to take place between man and between God. There would no longer be a separation anymore. And the Bible says that he now that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. We've become truly the body of Christ. But I believe that this heavenly host ready to praise God was just, I mean, when can we do it? Come on, I'm ready. We're ready. And they said, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. What? Good will toward men. Said this last week. Not good will among men. We tend to to look at this scripture as peace on earth, as in everybody wants to say peace on earth around Christmas time because we want peace between nations, peace between people, peace between the races, peace, peace, peace. But in reality, what this is, is this was a fulfillment of what we just read in Isaiah chapter 54. This is God saying, my kindness shall not be removed from you. Everlasting kindness. My covenant of peace shall not be removed. And so here he is. He's saying now, peace on earth. Peace between God and man. A union once again. And then goodwill toward men. That's goodwill coming from God towards me. I don't have to worry about whether or not God wants to do something in my life. Because he's mad at me, make me go through stuff because he thinks I need it. Uh uh. His everlasting kindness. The Bible says in James chapter 1 that um, let no man say that when he is tried, that God's the one that's testing me, that God's the one that's trying me, because God cannot be tempted with evil, neither does he tempt any man, every good and every perfect gift comes from God above and there is no even hint or shadow of turning. That is the God that we serve. He is our father. And our heavenly father would not do any less. Rather, he would do so much more than we as an earthly father or as an earthly mother would do for our children. If you have a, tr- if you have a problem, if you have a problem relating to God and wanting to know what his will is for you, how, what is your will for your children? Just make that relationship. Glory. Turn with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm going to ask Derek to come on up. So because of because of this event that we celebrate every year, this event that now we even measure our years by, our time by, our dates, when we say it's 2014 about to come to the close, we're saying that it's 2014 after the birth of of Jesus Christ. All of history is designed around this one event, the Word becoming flesh. Just pull it down just a, just a little bit. Um, look at with me in verse 17 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together not for the better, but for the worst. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. Remember Ephesians chapter 4 says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and peace. 
never bring your disagreements. Never bring your uh, divisions. Never bring those things into the church. Always come in endeavoring to keep the spirit of unity because that's where the power is. Now, let's look at verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. So we fast forward from the birth of Christ, 33 years to the night before he was betrayed, before he was crucified, and he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. It is the new covenant in my blood. What is what is the new covenant? It is a covenant of peace. It is a covenant where the life of God now lives on the inside of me. Paul says, the life I live, I now live by the faith of the Son of God. It's not me that lives, but it's Christ who lives in me. That very word... The very life of God that was in it, that now lives on the inside of me. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink in remembrance of me. Let's read on. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Keep that in mind. You do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Now, there's a number of powerful things that are in this, so I need to take a few moments to explain it because, um, you know, somebody asked me, why don't we do communion that often? And we're going to start doing it more often than we have. But I think that we can make communion a religious tradition and we can lose the power that is in it if we're not cautious about it. First of all, Notice he said in verse 24, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Now, did, was he saying do this in remembrance of me because there's a, a, there's a possibility you might forget Jesus? You know, sometimes I think that when we read that, we just think, well, we're just supposed to do this. You know, yes, Lord, we're doing this. We remember you. We re, you know, we're going to focus on you. I don't believe that's what he was saying at all. He was very specific that as you eat of the bread, it's my body that is broken for you. Now do this in remembrance of me. And I believe along with that in remembrance of what that means, in remembrance of what I did. When you're, when you're taking part and you're eating of the bread, you are partaking of the redemption that happened when Jesus died on the cross. His body was broken for us. What do we know from that? First Peter chapter two, verse 24 says that by his stripes, we were healed. That's what happened to his body. That's the reason that it was, it was broken. He goes on to say, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Because of his blood that was shed for us, it was the final sacrifice. Glory to God. When, 
When Jesus hung on the cross, he uttered these words, it is finished. What was he saying? He fulfilled the Old Testament. He fulfilled the sacrifice. Our sin was laid on him. Whatever you've done in your life, whatever mistakes you've made, maybe you've run from God, maybe he's been knocking at your door the whole time. Whatever, whatever you've done, all of that Jesus took care of. There is not a problem. God does not have a problem with you. God says, son, daughter, believe me. Let me come in and change your life. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It's so easy. It's just saying, Father, I'm just turning from living my own way. Jesus, I believe in you. I believed you were raised from the dead. On my behalf. And now I make you Lord of my life. Just come in and change me. It's as simple as that. It's that easy. Transformed lives. And then the life of God will begin to operate on the inside of you. And you can walk in that favor and grace and victory all the days of your life. This covenant of peace in my blood. Do it. So every time we drink, remember this represents the covenant that I have with Almighty God. This represents the fact that I am now a son of the Most High God. I am a child of God. He is my Father. And He has His kindness is everlasting towards me, and it will not be removed from me. And so because of that, uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 4 says that I can come boldly to the throne room of grace. I can go into the throne room of where my heavenly Father is, and I don't care uh, what temptations I've had. I don't care what mistakes I've made. He's there waiting to give me grace to help in my time of need. He is not withholding His goodness from me. He is not withholding things from me. He is warning me to receive the abundance of grace that he has provided for me. And in that grace is everything that I need to live. The Bible says that all things that pertain, he's given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. I've gone past my five minutes pretty bad, haven't I? So every time you drink, you're drinking, you're remembering this covenant of peace. You're remembering this grace now that's a part of who we are, this kindness. This is what Jesus did, this reconciliation. Now I'm reconciled back to God. Now, very quickly, look at verse 26, 27. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death. Why doesn't he say we show the Lord's resurrection? Why, why is communion about the Lord's death? Why, why is there nothing about the resurrection of Jesus in communion? Because what he did during his death is the thing that created the covenant and it's the thing that created healing for our bodies. It's where our sins were forgiven and taken care of once and for all. And so what we're doing as, and, and this where it says you do show, the, the, the literal, the, the Greek is we are proclaiming, we are announcing the Lord's death. We're not announcing that the Lord died. We're announcing what the Lord did when he died. I'm announcing what Jesus did in his body. I'm announcing to the forces of darkness that by his stripes, I was healed. I am announcing as I drink of the cup, I'm announcing that I now have a covenant with God and it's a covenant of peace and it's a covenant of favor. It's a covenant of grace and his kindness shall not be removed from me. I'm declaring that. 
faith without works is dead. I'm declaring what God did for me, what Jesus did for me when he said, it is finished. And so I don't care what the doctor has said to you. When Jesus said, it is finished, perfect healing has been made available to you. Wednesday night, I was trying to close the service and uh, I mean, cause we had to practice and things like that. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to close the service now. And the Holy Spirit said, no, you're not. I said, you're not done yet. And I said, okay. Does anybody need healing? Waited a few seconds. And was getting ready to close it again. And here comes little Caleb up here. Hey, Caleb, how you doing, buddy? And uh, came up and I said, what you need? He said, my throat hurts. So we just laid hands on it and thank God for his grace. Spoke to it in the name of Jesus and said, now go ahead and swallow. And he swallowed. I said, how's it feel? It don't hurt anymore. I said, well, swallow again. Let's make sure it don't hurt anymore. And other people came up to be healed. That's what it's about. We show the Lord's death till he come. That's why in verse 27, it says, Wherefore, um, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily. What does it mean to do it unworthily? It just simply means that you are not discerning what Jesus did on the cross. You're just doing it as a tradition. You're just doing it, not paying attention to what it really means. Not discerning the Lord's body, verse 29, he said in verse 30, look at this. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. In other words, a lot, of, a lot of you are weak and you're sick because you've not received of the benefit that comes out of taking communion. I'm telling you this morning, when we, when we take communion, if you have any sickness in your body, you need to proclaim. You are showing that you are healed by the stripes of Jesus. He says in verse 31, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. How do you judge yourself? Well, I judge myself according to the word of God, not according to what I've done. I judge myself according to what God has said about me, not according to how I've lived my life in the past. And what God has said about me is that I am the righteousness of God in Christ. What God has said about me is that I am healed by the stripes of Jesus. What God has said about me is that he supplies all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. What God has said about me is I'm a son. You're a daughter. I'm a child of the most high God. That's how I judge myself. I judge myself as one who is more than a conqueror through him that loved us. I judge myself as thanks be unto God who always gives me the victory. He always causes me to triumph. I judge myself as the one who has been loved. And so therefore I love. Amen. Amen. So this morning, there's no greater time than the birth of Jesus. When it was announced, this covenant of peace. Glory to God. So, as Derek sings a song that he wrote, what I'd like for, um, for you to do is just come up to this table and... Um, Get you a little piece of bread and get you, Jennifer, you want to come up here and help? Get you a little thing of juice and we're just going to partake of communion and we're going to proclaim and show forth the death of Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. Amen. 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 Derek. Yes, he 
This life on the cross for me. She looked up at her baby boy as he hung there dying on a tree. This little baby born in Bethlehem said it is finished and he set his mother free and he took my place he shed his grace on the cross for me and he took my place grace on the cross for me and he took my place oh he shed his grace on the cross for me he took my place He gave his life on the cross just for me. Jesus said, and notice he took it and he gave thanks, first of all. Let's just honor him. Stand up with me, please. And first of all, let's just thank him. Father, we just give you praise. Father, we thank you for the abundant supply of grace for everything that we need that's come as a result of your son Jesus the word that became flesh Father we thank you now he said take eat this is my body which is broken for you this do in remembrance of me so as you eat recognize that you're eating you're partaking of the redemptive quality that is in what Jesus did for you so go ahead and visualize that receive your healing as you eat this right now in Jesus name He said, this cup is the New Testament, the new covenant in my blood. Receive forgiveness of your sin. Receive his kindness towards you. Receive yourself made righteous, cleansed from the power of darkness You've been moved into the kingdom 
of his dear son and receive your place as a son and a daughter of the most high God. Receive that now as you drink. Father, we're so grateful. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We receive the benefits of the finished work of Jesus in our bodies, in our minds, in our emotions, in our spirits. Everything about us you have perfected. You perfect those things get, that concern us. And I'm confident of this very thing that he that began a good work will complete it, will perform it to the day of Christ. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Well, if you receive that, come on, give him praise. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. You may be seated. Father, we receive that.